would bring your word to life. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, convict our hearts where it's necessary. We pray, Lord, that we wouldn't fall into condemnation, but would rather, Lord, um, find the healing that you want to bring in us. Lord, we want to be used of you, especially, Lord, uh, in the days that we currently live. We want to be used of you, Lord. But we need your direction, Lord. We're, we're unable in and of ourselves and our own knowledge to filter everything out. We need your direction. And so we ask, Lord, that you bring your word to life and that you speak to us, uh, each of us, where we're at. Lord, you know the things that we need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a sense within all of us that we are not living the lives we are intended to live. We know this. It's within us. And in John 10.10, 10, Jesus said that he came to bring us life, life to the full, because he knows that we need that. And we know that we need that. But there's also an enemy that knows that we need that. And so as we seek real life, he offers a counterfeit. And I don't like to spend a lot of time talking about the counterfeit. I like to talk about the real thing. But God thinks it's important enough from time to time in his word to talk about the counterfeit. What are some of the markings of the counterfeit? Some of the things that, that stand out. I want to talk about that this morning um, because... The enemy's always about this from the beginning. He's been constantly trying to twist things. You go back to the garden when uh, the enemy was trying to uh, turn Adam and Eve from God's heart. The enemy took what God had said and he tried to just twist a little bit so that it sounds appealing and it sounds very similar to what the Lord is offering, but the end result is very different. The end result is death. In 2 Peter, Peter reminds us of some of these things. In the first chapter, Peter's talking about the gospel, um, talking about how God has spoken through his prophets. But then in the second chapter, he turns and he starts talking about false prophets, false teachers. False prophets and false teachers do not teach things that sound the opposite of truth. They sound very much like truth, but they are twisted ever so slightly. But one of the things that Jesus reminds us of is that we will know them by their fruit. We want to look at fruit. What is being produced here? This sounds a lot like truth. It sounds really good. But what is the fruit that is coming from here? In 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter begins to talk about some of the signs of counterfeit. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And as we talk about this, this is not for condemnation, okay? Because all of us fall into some of this. It's very easy to do. And that's why we have God's Word. We need God's Word. You cannot navigate without God's Word. You will be fooled. If you in your pride think, oh, I can tell the real from the counterfeit, you have set yourself up for failure. You need God's Word. And not just memories of God's Word. You need to be constantly in God's Word. So in 2 Peter chapter 2, um, Peter begins to not only point out some things about the counterfeit, but he gives us hope in the midst of it. Because he makes it clear that those who are counterfeit, they will be judged. But he also gives us hope that in the midst of judgment, God is able to Protect those who pursue him. And so right now, as we look at chaos that's going around us, we can have a, a sense and a security that God is able to protect us as we live in the midst of it. 
But at the same time, we don't want to find ourselves being sucked into it. We want to remain true to the Lord. So, first verse, he says, But there were also false prophets in Israel. Just as there will also be false teachers among you, they will cleverly teach destructive heresies. These are clever, okay? These are not things that you go, oh, who would believe that? That's ridiculous. These are things that you go, huh, that makes a lot of sense. I really like what this person is saying. If we don't have the word, that's where we end up going. It says that even deny the master who bought them. And you've all heard the illustration, maybe you haven't, most of you have heard the illustration of the frog, you know, you throw a frog into a hot pan, he jumps out, but if you slowly turn up the heat, he'll remain and he'll fry. You know, when we look at this and we say, deny the master who bought them, I would never follow such a thing. It's little by little by little. This way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teaching. Many will follow their evil teaching. Wouldn't it be nice if the majority went with the truth? Wouldn't that be so nice? Because then you could be like, oh, that's just some weirdos out there on the side. But that's not how it is. The majority will go with the untruth. You, in order to stand with the Lord, in order to stand with truth, as the scripture was talked about with David, who was standing up for the Lord, not only was he being mocked by the enemy, he was being mocked by the people of God who stood with him. That's what it is to really follow God and to really be used of him. It's not easy. But the Lord gives us what we need. The Lord gives us what we need through His Spirit. Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. The reason that truth gets slandered is because many of these evil teachers, again, they're teaching what sounds like truth. There's just a little twist. And so when somebody else hears the real truth, they go, oh, I've heard that before know what you people are about. No, 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 that wasn't, they weren't actually following the Lord. Oh, sure. It sounds real similar to me. That's why the way of truth gets slandered. And that's also why, again, we each individually must pursue God ourselves and his word. You can't listen to me. You can't listen to others. You've got to pursue it. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. I think it's one that we we know. We see a lot of this. People who claim to be speaking for God, and it's all about getting, getting money. Getting money. But God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be delayed. For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell, into gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment. And God did not spare the ancient world, except for Noah and the seven others and his family, Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. I mean, think about that. An entire world, and you've got Noah and his family, and that's all that goes into the ark. The rest of the world rejects the Lord. I mean, when, when we look at us, we're, we're a fairly small gathering And even when you look in our nation and around the world, compared to the world's population, I mean, those who are truly following the Lord, it is a small, small amount. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people in a vast flood. I also want you to hear that. When we follow the Lord, he's able to protect us. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. But God also rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man who was sick of the same shameful immorality of the wicked people around him. So once again, I want you to see this. You've got an entire town, 
okay? And you've got one guy who's following the Lord. And his soul's being tormented. And God does bring judgment. But when he does it, he protects the one who is genuinely following the Lord. So we can rest in that. We can rest that when, even when God's judgment comes down on people around us, when we genuinely follow the Lord, he's able to protect us. And, and once again, I want you to see the numbers here. The vast majority, you got one guy, one guy following the Lord. You didn't have several churches. You didn't even have one big church. You didn't have one. You got one guy following the Lord. This is what we see in history. Are, is the time that we live in now different than all of history? Are we suddenly better people? That, the scripture doesn't speak anything about that. But we have that idea of we're like, oh, well, that was a different time. Now people are mostly good. Verse 8, yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day after day. I'm trying really hard not to get discouraged by what I see around me. It's so pervasive, so pervasive. But God is able to deliver. So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials. This is what I want you to hear. He knows how to rescue us, even in the midst of this. So if you are a person who finds yourself like Lot, being tormented by these things, um, and you're wondering, you know, what's going to happen with all of this going on around us? Because my faith says, oh, Jesus will protect me. But there are times as I look at all the fires around us, I go, oh, man, what's going to happen? And I have to come back to this. God says he's able to protect. Even as things fall down all around me, he's able to protect. You go back to Egypt when God was bringing judgment on Egypt. He was able to protect his people in the midst of it. Right now, as God brings things all around us, God is able to protect us. Even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of final judgment. Verse 10. This is where I really want to dig in. He is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and who despise authority. These people are proud and arrogant, even daring, daring even to scoff at supernatural beings without so much as trembling. I'm going to step on a lot of toes this morning because I hear a lot of things coming out of us and people around us that contradict this scripture, okay? A lot of parts of it. We're going to start off, in the first part it says, he is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and despise authority. I thought sin was sin. Isn't all sin the same? I hear it so often, I, I mean, I hear it constantly. Sin, sin, right? Well, Peter must be wrong here. God looks at certain sin with a special disdain. It's good intention, okay? We have good intention for saying things like that. And I'm going to go to where we get mixed up in Scripture and why we say things like this. But first of all, let me point this out. None of us <laughs> would ever really be in agreement with that statement. I mean, imagine you get pulled over for a speeding ticket and the officer says, sorry, you're going to spend your life in jail because sin is sin and this is like murder. You're like, what? This is not murder? I was speeding. Well, yeah, but you're speeding and that's dangerous and you could have killed someone, but I didn't. We would go nuts. Or what if you heard of someone who killed somebody? Let's say your neighbor kills another neighbor. And you find out they got a $200 fine because, hey, sin is sin. What? No. <laughs> they went through with it. 
I mean, I've had some bad thoughts and I, you know, some things I shouldn't think of, but he went through with it. We, we, can't, we can't allow that to happen. You see what I'm saying? We would go nuts. But yet we say things like this. Why do we say things like this? God doesn't say things like this. Well, part of it comes from this. We look at scriptures like James 2.10. James 2.10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. What was James's point? Even if you sin a little, okay, the smallest little thing, and if you go to the context of what James was talking about there, James was talking about favoring some people in the church over others. That may not seem like a big deal. But what he's saying is this. We need to take sin seriously because all sin separates us from God. All right? Even if, and this, nobody's done this. Everyone has sinned much more than this. But even if you just sinned a little bit, okay, it would separate you from God. And so James is saying, take it seriously. All sin will separate you from God. That's his point. But does that mean that the person who goes five miles an hour over the speed limit is the same as the person who goes over in anger and pulls a gun and just point-blank shoots somebody. <laughs> None of us think that. That is not the case. And that is not the case for the Lord. The Lord is going to bring much harsher judgment on the other. And again, Scripture talks about that. We're going to get into the, some of those things. Another Scripture that causes confusion. You go to the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus talks about adultery and murder. And He says... That if you commit adultery in your heart, just thinking about it, you've already done it in your heart. He doesn't say you've already done it. If you sit and dwell on something and focus on something, is that sin? Yes, it is. Is it the same as someone who goes and acts out? No! If it were, why not just go act out if you think about it? It's all the same consequences. If you're speeding along and you're like, oh, I broke the speed limit. I'm really mad at Bill over here. I think I'm going to go murder him. I've already crossed the line. See, what I'm, that, that's ludicrous. But we get confused. The point that Jesus was saying is the same point that James was saying. Take your sin seriously. How do you get to the point that you commit adultery? You start by thinking about it and dwelling on it and allowing that to go in your mind. That's how you get there. And so in that scripture, Jesus talks about, you know, if your eyes causing you to sin, gouge it out. Is he saying really gouge it out? No. But what he's saying is, take it seriously. You see what I'm saying? We want to take our sin seriously, but we want to be careful. We don't want to say things like, oh, sin is sin. It's, it's, it's all the same. Scripture doesn't back that up. When Jesus was being handed over and he's talking to Pilate, he says in John 19.11, that the one who handed him over had greater sin. Is there such a thing as greater sin? Absolutely. And one of the things that we find in Scripture is that many times greater sin has to do with knowledge. When we understand what we're doing and we move ahead anyway, oftentimes we, have, we will have greater judgment. Um, Matthew 23, 13 through 36, I'm not going to read it, but Jesus is talking to the religious leaders and he's talking about the judgment that they will have. Again, they have the knowledge, but they continue on. Um, in Matthew eleven twenty three 23 and 24, he says that, that Sodom, okay, that we've already read about, will be better off on the day of judgment than Capernaum because of the miracles that Capernaum saw in their presence. They will be better off. There are levels of judgment. What's it look like? We don't know. All sin will separate you from God, okay? But hear this. God is just. He is not going to punish the person who speeds the way He punishes the person who murders. Is He going to punish both if you cross the line? Yes. And here's the other good news. And this is where we want to get to. The good news is that the solution for all of it is the same. The blood of Jesus. 
Is it any harder to save the murderer than it is the speeder? Not for God. It's all the same. But we want to be careful with our language. Okay, again, what we're talking about here is when we counterfeit stuff, we're taking the truth and we're twisting it just a little bit. But again, we've talked about this before, if you get off track, at first it appears like you're not. Because it's just a little bit and you can barely see it. But the further you go down the road, you know, if you get off track just an angle, I'll go this way. <laughs> if you get off track just a little bit of an angle, at first you're here. But the further you go out, the further the separation is. And the enemy knows this, and this is why he goes for the subtle. He goes for the subtle so that we will get out. So, in this scripture, he's making clear that God will be especially hard on these things, okay? But, when you look at these two things that are mentioned in 2 Peter 2.10, twisted sexual desire despising authority, those two things mark our culture right now. They mark our culture. I believe that God wants to bring about repentance in our nation. I believe that's what He wants. But if the nation refuses, I do believe that judgment will come. Because that's what Scripture talks about over and over. But here's the thing. What happens is, is that we begin to, out of wanting to relate to the culture and so on, the church begins to align and allow things in. Because we want to be careful not to condemn people and we want to make them feel loved. Again, the whole, hey, all sin's the same. I believe it's out of a pure motive. It wants people to feel loved and feel hopeful. But it's not truth. So in the same way, when you talk about these things of the twisted sexual desire and the uh, disobedience to authority, that's what we see in the culture. And, but what we do is we try to reach out and we try to say, well, it's not that bad. And eventually it starts coming into the church. And eventually then we start getting off track. I mean, when you look at the culture, for instance, how did the culture get off track when you talk about the sexual part? Well, at first it started with just, hey, it, it can happen outside the marriage covenant. That's okay. It's not a big deal. Where are we today because of that? Today, we have people who are now openly saying that this kind of intimacy, I'm trying to watch my language because of little ears here, this kind of, not yours, Roscoe. <laughs> We have people today saying this kind of intimacy with, with adults and children is, is okay. How do you get there? You step out of what God says. And at first, it just, it just seems so slight. It's not that big of a deal. But then, whoof, on down the road, you're out here. You see what I'm saying? And although it's so pervasive, go back to Sodom, think about Lot. It's so pervasive. And you want to just say, well, what? Or it's okay, and you just want to get along with everybody. You want people to come to your church. So you just say, ah, it, not a big deal. God saved one, destroyed the rest. We want to pursue God. We don't want to just give in and say that things are okay. I mean, because we took that little step, and we said, okay, outside of a marriage covenant, this physical intimacy is okay. What's that led to? We are murdering, murdering babies. And it's all centered on that. Because we want to be able to do what we want when we want. And we don't want any consequences. Is that going to bring judgment? It is. And we've got to be real careful. Now the other thing that's marked here, it says, is despise authority. Man, that's rising up right now cloaked like that? No, it's not cloaked like that. It's cloaked like we need to stand up for the oppressed. Do we need to stand up for the oppressed? Absolutely. But we need to be careful. We need to be careful. That's what we're doing. When you go back to the, the first part, the twisted sexual desire, what was that about? They used words like love. It's all about love. We, we need to love each other. We, we don't want to stop love. 
And so it's all about language, but we need to be careful that we don't jump into this. Again, it sounds good. We, do we want to stand up to oppression? Absolutely. But do we want to rise up and despise authority? No. But that's what we're seeing all around us. And we want to guard our hearts from that. And we want to keep that from coming into church. And we want to follow the Lord. If you haven't been stepped on, we're not done. These people are proud and arrogant, daring even to scoff at supernatural beings without so much as trembling. But the angels who are far greater in power and strength do not dare to bring from the Lord a charge of blasphemy against those supernatural beings. The book of Jude also talks about this. I'm not going to get into that. We have authority. We have authority. But we need to be very careful. Because another thing that I hear coming out is we start talking directly to supernatural beings and acting like we're the stuff because we're on God's team. Scripture doesn't back that. Scripture does not back that. When you go to the book of Jude, you have the archangel Michael, who's much more mighty than any of us. He said, the Lord rebuke you. He didn't say, I rebuke you because I come in the authority of Jesus. He said, the Lord rebuke you. Again, slight variation, and it may not seem like much, but man, it can take you down a road to where all of a sudden you become the man or woman other than God. Because you're walking in all this authority. We need to be careful. Do we want to walk in authority? Absolutely. Do we want to be like David who charges straight ahead? Absolutely. When God tells us to. But we need to come in the name of the Lord. We don't want to come out there and say, I'm God's kid and whatever I say goes. No. We want to come in with confidence in God, not ourselves. It's slight. You see it? It's, it's slight. But on down the road, it will lead you far away from the Lord. I believe the Lord wants to share these things because right now we have a lot of things pulling at us pulling at us and as we feel the pull we want to go back to the word God center us because it's hard to bring discernment because the voices they all sound so good you know if you've ever uh, been in court or, or just watched a TV show or something you know you hear one person's side it, 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 you know working in law enforcement this happens a lot you hear one person's side. They come in, they tell you their story. And you're like, that other person is evil. We need to do something about them. We need to go get them and arrest them right now. But then you stop and you're like, but, but I know that I shouldn't do that. So I'm going to go listen to the other side. So then you listen to the other side and you're like, holy cow, that's nothing like what they told me. Now the, it's the other person. They're the one in the wrong. You know what I'm saying? That's why as we're trying to discern things, we need to slow down and we need to go to God's word. We need to ask for discernment. We need to be careful that we don't just jump on the boat with things. Because there are many false teachers, many false prophets all around us. And not only do we not want to follow them, we don't, we don't want to be those people. And the way we guard against that is God's word. We keep going back trusting that even if we are in the minority and the majority are not following the Lord that God is able to protect us in the midst of it God we live in trying times right now Lord we want to follow you Lord again I just pray for conviction for all of us all of us Lord because all of us get off track but in your grace, you draw us back. Give us the humility, Lord, that when we get off track to repent and to come back to you, Lord. Lord, give us discernment. Give us strength to stand against the waves that are around us. To stand against the majority. Like David, when not only is it the enemy ridiculing us, it's the people standing with us. 
Give us, Lord, the faith to charge straight ahead at the enemy, Lord, when you tell us. And to tune out the other voices and to just trust, to just trust that you are able to protect us in the midst of all that's going on. Lord, we love you and it's in Jesus' name we